please join us in welcoming the Phoenix Suns head coach, Earl Watson. Earl, you have a great story. Would you share that with us and tell us what led you to where you are today? Um, a lot of mistakes in life. <laughs> to be honest, which is no perfect path. Uh, I'm from Kansas City, Kansas. I grew up in a small town. Across the river is Kansas City, Missouri. So whenever I tell people I'm from Kansas City, they go, oh, Missouri. Go, no, Kansas. They go, what? Confuses people. But um, I was one of the top point guards in high school. And somehow, the University of Kansas, which is only 20 minutes from my house, did not recruit me. <laughs> True. UCLA won the national championship in 95. I graduated in 97 from high school, and they offered me a scholarship. And coincidentally enough, it was a guy that grew up with my father by the name of Lucius Allen, who had came from my neighborhood, and my dad would always talk to me about UCLA. So I was already brainwashed. But we all know when we were 18, 17, I graduated when I was 17, when it was time to leave, I was afraid to leave my family, so I would have hoped that KU would come in late. True story. I get on a phone call with Roy Williams. He tells me that UCLA signed Baron Davis, who was the number one point guard in the country. I was number seven. I said, yeah, I know. It's one of my best friends. We committed on the same day. He said, you're not going to play. So maybe we can get back in late and you can come to the University of Kansas and stay home. Those are the worst words he could have ever told me, that I could not do something. So I said, no, I appreciate your concern for me, even though we just met. I really love you so much. <laughs> I think I'm going to stay with UCLA, and I'm going to see if I'm good enough to make it into the NBA. And I don't have to walk to school in the snow. Right? So I go to UCLA, 1997. Baron Davis is my roommate. He ends up being a lottery pick after his second year. And I ended up starting the most games in the history of UCLA consecutively. He and I was the first two freshmen in 97 to start since 1979. So that kind of built a fire. So my first day on campus, I meet this guy who, to me, was like, it's like basketball heaven. He came into the basketball office gingerly. And he had this presence about him that was angelic and he spoke so deep that you felt like he was always talking to you and he wasn't and he goes hello young man my name is coach john wooden i'm like <laughs> this is why i came here just to meet you and we talked for a little bit and he gave me his telephone number which was really odd i didn't i didn't think he would really give me his number i was like he's like call me anytime i was like i will so Steve Lavin, who recruited me, took me to Pauley Pavilion. We walk into Pauley Pavilion, and there's this guy just running pickup games and, you know, have all these ex-NBA players, these young potential NBA players and current NBA players. They're playing and playing and playing. And game stops. He walks up to the coach, introduces, you know, coach introduces me to him. He goes, how you doing? I'm Magic Johnson. I go, love you. I was like, how can I get in this game? He said, be here every day at 8. If you're late, you will not play. I said, I'd be here at 7.30. So the next day, I get there at 7.30. Magic gets there about 7.40. I'm sitting down on the sideline waiting for people to come into the gym. Magic walks, I will never forget this day. Magic walks up to me and he says, you will not play today. I said, why? He said, because you're sitting down. You should be working on your free throws. Do not ever let me walk into a gym and see you sitting on the sideline. Changed my entire work ethic my life. So I've been lucky to meet these people. Um, how many read The Alchemist? That's like my life. I've been very lucky to meet these people on my journey. And you meet these amazing people and they just give you snippets of omens to change you, to grow you, to make you better. Um, the story goes on from Hubie Brown to Jerry West to Jerry Sloan to, you know, R.C. Buford and Greg Popovich who started my coaching career. 
uh, stops in Utah with you know, Scott Lady, who's now the GM of Minnesota, old school coaches like Dick Carter. So I have all these amazing coaches in my life, and I never wanted to be an NBA lifer because you have no life. I mean, I'm gonna play 13 years, 12 years, I'm gonna retire, I'm gonna leave it alone. And then I started travel teams. And I started giving the game of basketball back. Then I started having all these basketball legends come into my life. And I realized that basketball is a gift that you do not keep. It's a gift and a treasure that you give away to that next generation, to the next kid of hope, of inspiration. And it parallels life, which we learned from Coach Woody, which is the pyramid of success. Coach, you came to the... You could all soak that in for a minute. Coach, this, this question is about accountability. You came to Phoenix to rebuild a team that had some on and off court challenges in recent years. Uh, what advice can you give us on the power of language to improve relationships with our patients and our colleagues? And how's that translated into the culture you're building here? Um, the world, the world needs more leaders and less bosses, right? People fall in love with the title of their work description. And for, for us, we never want to be called coaches, but yet teachers of life, teachers of basketball. Um, what I've learned most in life, like all of us, is we get to this point where we have a certain plateau, a certain peak, where you're a CEO or a manager or an NBA head coach, and then you go speak to younger people, and we present it like we have it all together. We don't. One of the greatest, one of the greatest opportunities is through redirection, which is most people define as a mistake. So the truth why, you know, you talk about me coming to Phoenix, I really just came to Phoenix to be closer to my daughter in LA. <laughs> That's how I initially came here. I started with the Spurs, and my contract was up. Phoenix called me and they had an opportunity. And I, I met this guy, my life is really unique, I met this guy at a subway shop probably four years prior to all of this happening. I'm sitting at a subway shop on Hollywood Boulevard, which can be interesting. <laughs> and this guy keeps pace, I'm like, oh man, here we go. I'm just trying to eat a sub man, and go to Pilates. So this guy just keeps pacing, and he stops and he goes, Earl, and I've never seen this guy in my life. I go, what's up? He goes, man, went to school with you. I'm like, where? He's like, you still there? I was like, yeah, 45,000 people. It's possible. <laughs> I go, what's up, man? He goes, listen, um, I'm having, my boss is having a birthday party for his son, and I would like for you and Baron Davis to come. And this is like probably 2012. I said, man, Baron and I, we stopped being roommates in 1999. <laughs> I don't know where he's at, but listen, I don't really do birthday parties. Like, I'm sure you can rent, like, you know, a jump, a jumping house or something. Like I don't know what I'm doing at a birthday party. He goes, no, 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 no. Trust me, you want to come. This is really important. His mom used to do inside stuff, and his dad is the CEO of Disney. I said, all right, take my number. <laughs> I actually love the mom. I grew up watching her when I saw her. Oh my God. I was real watching you. You're in a mom Rashad like every Saturday morning. So I get to the house, and it's amazing. The dad comes home, and the dad goes, "Thank you for coming. Anything you need at Disney, you need tickets. Just let me know. I get you tickets." I go, "Listen, I can buy my own tickets. I don't need Disney tickets." I said, "I need you to give me something that can change my life, that I can always use for myself to improve myself and make myself better." And he told me this, it stuck with me forever. He goes, I started in a mailroom at Disney. I kept working my way up. Every promotion I took, I didn't care if it paid less or paid more. I just wanted to take a step in the right direction. He's like, if you do things for money, you will always have a ceiling. If you do things for improvement, there is no limitation. That stuck with me. So, at the end of my 13th year of playing the NBA, I got phone calls to play again, to have like a Ronnie Price role, which is easy money. It's easy, you're full of character, you love basketball, I can, I can play a kid's game all day and make $1.8 million, it's easy, right? Uh, no, I needed to follow my heart because of that story. So I took a job in the Spurs D League that only paid 15,000. So I turned down 1.8 for 15,000. 
because I wanted to learn from who I thought was the best to ever do it in the last two decades. And I knew that knowledge that I learned there and the information and the tutoring and those relationships were bigger than a paycheck. And then that's when I brought that here. So before I took the job here, my agent called me and said, hey, Popovich wants you to call. I'm like, no, I can't tell him no. Like, I'm not calling him back. Get a sign quick and say you couldn't find me, right? So that's how I ended up here. And things kind of led to another. And it's an amazing opportunity. But I never thought I would be here past one or two seasons. I thought it was like the alchemist, just a part of my journey leading me to a different destination. Coach, hiring a talented team is a challenge every leader faces when building a strong, successful organization. What advice can you give us on the qualities we should look for when hiring new team members and how to avoid the damage of a toxic hire? Um, we're really big on intel. So it's very important that we find out the background of someone's character. You know, no one's gonna be perfect. And I kind of like people who overcome adversity. Because we understand throughout the course of the game, we have a strategy and a game plan. And it can switch at any given moment through, you know, mental fatigue, physical fatigue, or, you know, exceptional refereeing. <laughs> like last night. It can change at any moment, right? So you gotta be will you gotta be ready and have even kill and understand that basketball is just a reflection of life. We wake up every day and we have a positive attitude. It's all a choice. We can't determine what is going to happen next. But whatever happens, you have about 15 minutes to have a natural reaction. But that natural reaction has to be overcome by a positive attitude. Because if not, you will lose all momentum you built in your life. And we know life can change quickly with negativity. It's hard to get out. You know, power of the subconscious is very difficult. So for us, we want to know you. We need to know the character of the person, the background, the adversity they overcome. Ronnie Price, the next NBA head coach. But it's the background, and we need to talk to you. Classic example, Alan Williams. Last year, he's playing in China. He comes back home to Phoenix. Um, we need players to fill our roster. He has a tryout. We come into the tryout. We stop it in 10 minutes. He is out of shape. And it's hard to believe that Alan Williams wasn't prepared, right? He's completely out of shape. So walk up to him. We cut it short. The first thing I say to him is, how do you come to an NBA workout, opportunity of a lifetime, and you're not prepared? And he said, <laughs> Sorry, sir. <laughs> I'm like, like the same age. Was, so I'm like, listen, we're going on a road trip. Now, before I ask him, I go, okay, what does your parents do? And he said, <laughs> I'm gonna speak candidly to you. He said, my mom is a police chief, and my dad is a judge. My react, I was not, I was not ready for that. My reaction was, oh shit. <laughs> like here. Hey, we, we come back in a week. <laughs> I was like, we come back in a week, I need you to go in the gym, get prepared, get in shape, and we give you the opportunity. And the only reason why we gave him an opportunity was because we knew he had high character. Talent gives you an opportunity. Character gives you longevity. Talent, event, talent eventually becomes old if you don't have character. So that's very important. And then, thinking outside the box. I think diversity is always great whether it's ethnicity, whether it's gender, you have to have different people around you that can challenge you mentally. Never want to be the smartest guy in the room. Never. I never want to be the smartest guys around all my friends. We all know the five closest people to you define who you are and what you will become. Be careful who those five people are. Always be aware. And we want people who are willing to grow, who are willing to think outside the box, and not how can we do it better, but how can we do it different? Better isn't always better. Different is unique. Different captures you. Different changes the game. Different builds momentum. Different to me is a paradigm shift. 
And that's who we kind of seek. And which, which is why you see Alan Williams, Tyler Ulis, right? It's different. They, you know, the combination of the two are just great together. Coach, this question is about motivation. Uh, everybody in this room chose health care because we do care about people, uh, character and talent, and especially keeping patients healthy. Uh, there's so much time spent on administrative hassles and bureaucracy in health care now. Uh, physicians are spending a lot less time doing what they love, which is uh, taking care of patients, and they're less excited to stay in medicine. You've got to keep your players part of your job. Um, what advice can you give us to help keep our teams motivated? Um, my daughter is seven and my son is two. So I kind of went reverse. I'm dealing with teenagers right now. I don't have any experience. <laughs> this is the truth. But they help me for later. They help me for later in life too. Um, motivated, inspiration. There is no blueprint to it. You have to trust your gut, you have to be creative, you have to always connect, and you have to understand that sometimes, maybe, this is exactly where we are supposed to be. Maybe we're not supposed to be at the peak yet. And maybe we need to be here in the valley so we can learn lessons that can prepare us for what's next and what's coming. TC, Tyson Chandler. Hey, true story. I met Tyson Chandler when he was in the eighth grade. Baron Davis and I used to pick him up and take him to get pizza to try to get him to come to UCLA. <laughs> Obviously, he went to the NBA instead, but I love him. It's like my brother. We have to get it. We have to get it done any way possible, Tyson. That's a part of recruiting. That's a part of the recruiting. <laughs> He, he's, I love him. I wish, if my son ends up like him, I'm a happy father. High character, amazing person. His life after basketball will be bigger than his court presence ever. And he has a gold medal world championship. But whatever he does after basketball it will be monumental. You need people like that. But motivated, it's, it's, it's not anything set. Um, so listening to you talk is like coaches talking to agents and people who like just the everything around him takes away the substance. I think that the greatest thing is you have to remember and always stay true to why you started. Never lose the love, recapture the love, and understand changing lives is most important. So sometimes I have to sit in front of, I don't know if they're still here, in front of media, and they ask me questions that sometimes my mind is elsewhere, right? My mind might be, how do we get our group back on the same page? And then ask me a question about foul calls and referees. Sometimes you're just not there mentally. So the balance is very important. And what I would say mostly, what we do that's kind of unique is once a week, we go to a yoga studio and we connect outside of basketball. We connect in different ways. So that way we have an intimate relationship and we also have a program, like a cycle, our crep cycle of what we need to be, it's not basketball related, to have a purpose in what the vision truly is. So instead of saying, we have to you know, pass the ball, we can say we have to have you know, synergy, we have to have character, we have to be open to development, we have to be open to love. It's not basketball terminology, but it is. It's life. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's fluid. It's, there's no real answer. And never be afraid to make a mistake. Never. The greatest, you know, the greatest things in life happen after a mistake. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer is I love when it's a chance to redirect my path. Because that means I was headed in the wrong direction. Now I'm headed towards my purpose. And that's the greatest feeling, knowing that this is not the possibility, but yet that is. If that makes sense. Thank you. Just to wrap up, can you, I know we only have just a, a few more moments, can you tell us what, what went through your mind last night during that crazy game? <laughs> that there was just a lot of things going on, you know, between injections and, and 
block shots, and it was just a crazy two minutes that went on. Um, you can't lead emotionally. You can have emotional pockets to where you, you know, you're giving back energy, you're giving back motivation and fire, or you just have to confront a referee. But I learned that I, you cannot think your best when you're too high or too low. So people think I have this kill demeanor on the sideline, this even kill where, where I can just, just be. And really I'm calming myself down. <laughs> to be honest with you. I'm calming myself down because I understand that I can't lose control. If I ever lose control, the team will lose control. The players will lose control. And it just looks bad, right? It's just a bad one. I don't feel like my mom calling me. I don't want that conversation. You know, so like you have to just be very deep with purpose. But there's so many emotions. I think at the end of the day, you're always meant to be fatigued after every game. Um, sometimes physically and all we want is we all have this we all have this scoreboard that's internal and it's called effort and no matter what you do only you know that true score so if you can go to sleep at night every night knowing you gave your best in the last 24 hours then you're winning success is going to always come your way but if you can't go to sleep and you feel like you should be doing something else, you feel like you should be doing more, then I will always say follow your passion and follow your heart. So we go through life, right? And we ask kids, young people, we be like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Why do we have to have that answer? Why can't we just go through life and get experiences and journey through life and then eventually when it hits us, it hits us? Because I think we all went to college with a major and did something opposite. <laughs> it never works that way. Like, we don't know. We just don't know. And at that age, it's between 18 and 22. So, those guys are between 18 and 22. Right? So, how did we get 15 guys between 18 and 22, no, probably seven between 18 and 22, all multi millionaires to share one basketball? <laughs> when their whole life, they were told to be the best that they can be on the court and to dominate every possession, to give them an opportunity for a free education, to give them an opportunity for a chance to financially change their parents' lives. Now we get here and we say, stop it. Share the basketball. It's not easy. That's why it's like every day is a different day. Like today is more, for us, is more of a teaching day. Today for us was allowing our older players to dominate our younger players, to let them know you're playing better, but you haven't arrived. Right? It's a constant journey. So, The Alchemist is a great book, and reading helps a lot. The Alchemist, um, John Gordon, the carpenter. Um, with us, we believe love, nurture, teach. He was a big person on love, serve, care. And that's your business. And that's our business. We are servants. The moment we come to work, and the moment we feel like someone should, should serve us, we need to quit and fall back and realize why we started and the people who served us and loved us that made us want to do exactly what we are doing today from when we were a child, like kids, childhood. So I'd like to say thank you. Um, I love these opportunities. I don't like coming to this. When I get here, I love it. It's only because my mind is already on how to beat the Lakers. <laughs> it goes way back because because their, their, their original owner went to USC, so it goes back to USC, UCLA. I just can't stand them. You know, just every chance I get, anything USC, I can see a little kid with a USC shirt about to shoot, I get out of my car and go block the shot. <laughs> Jump in my car and drive off real quick. <laughs> no, I'm just playing, maybe. Maybe, maybe I would, maybe I probably would have. But thanks a lot for having me. Any questions, anything from you all you wanted a crowd to ask, I'll stay 10 minutes, answer those questions, and then we have to go talk about how to get our teenagers to get 21 and then win before they turn 21. <laughs>
Does anybody have a question? Come on now. Hold on. Okay, do you have a favorite part about playing basketball? My favorite part about playing basketball? Winning. <laughs> it changes my life. I'll be honest with you, like, I'm the biggest sore loser ever. But I'm also really honest with myself. So like, if I understand if I didn't do something right, I didn't prepare right, or I didn't give it my all, or I should have gave it more, or maybe I shouldn't have got a Marquise Chris tech, right? You know, we just labeled it Marquise Chris now, because you always get technical files. So with me, it's always winning, but it's everything that goes into the process of winning. It's the, it's the work, it's the, it's, the, it's the grind you put in in the summer, and the dedication that gives you the reward. Okay, and my last question. If you didn't play basketball, what other sport would you play? None. <laughs> I, I try to go to football. Okay, it's a true story. So I, I'm in the second grade. I grew up in Kansas City. The Royals won the World Series in like 85, right? So baseball's hot. So if you ever grow up in the Midwest, you know any day at any time it can be a tornado warning, right? It was sunny, I'm on my way to baseball practice, it starts to thunderstorm, I get out the car, they cancel practice, I throw down my glove, I roll around in the grass, my brother's like, get up, get up. I'm like, I quit, I quit, I'm gonna just play basketball. So that was like my redirection moment, so that's how I ended up playing basketball. <laughs> Barbosa. Any other questions? If not, I have one final question. Coach, what is the best advice you've ever received? Honestly, the life is really short. Follow your heart, do what you love. Um, the most uncool people in life, the most cool people are the most uncool people in life. Uncool people find a way to succeed. Cool people follow the mass and they just fall by the wayside. So be uncool. Um, other than that, give away everything you have. Nothing is meant to keep. You can't take anything after you leave here. Just leave it all behind. And change someone's life every day that doesn't, it's not related to you. That's the biggest impact you can have. I had, a, I had a middle school teacher. I went to an inner city school. I'm not the exception to any rule. I went to the inner city school and I had this counselor who will always pull me into her office. And then my mom and dad, they loved me, they tell me they love me every day, but after a while it just becomes like, okay, okay, I believe you, right? She would pull me into her office and she had no relation to me. And she told me I could be great. And I was like, for real? She's like, yes. I'm like, wow, like I believe it. So it's always the stranger that changes your life or someone not related. So be that person and you'd be surprised how many people open up the doors for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.